Hey everybody, Greg Bendian here. As many of you know from the progressive music community, we recently lost a great drummer and musician, Ralph Humphrey. And in the last days of his time here on earth, I was able to speak with him and interview him with my co-host for this episode, great drummer, Andy Edwards from the UK. And if you're not familiar with Andy's channel, check out his content. He's got a lot of great progressive music and jazz content on his YouTube channel, Andy Edwards. So Andy was instrumental in setting up this meeting with Ralph. As you can imagine, I grew up listening to Ralph on Roxy and Elsewhere with Frank Zappa, Atlantis by Wayne Shorter, his work with Don Ellis. It's just vast. Um, so I wanted to present this episode to you, even though we had some technical difficulties and Andy had to take over for part of the interview, but the content's great and I think you'll enjoy it. It's an incredible history lesson with one of the great musical drummers of my lifetime, Ralph Humphrey. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. I'm Greg Bendian and today's a kind of a unique episode because it's going to be a uh, intercontinental sharing of information related to rhythm. And today uh, we have two amazing drummers. So it's a bit of a drummer circle today. We have Andy Edwards from the UK. Hello there, not worthy, not worthy. <laughs> oh, indeed you are, sir. And we have one of the, the heaviest cats in the history of drumming. We have Mr. Ralph Humphreys with us today. So that's a treat. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. <laughs> good and, to have you, Ralph. You so good, to, good to see you again. So I don't know where we should start because there's so much to cover. So I know Andy's got a bit of a plan. So I want to throw to Andy and 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 Andy, you you get us started. Um, I would, I mean, because it's it's really starting for you, I suppose, near the beginning. Is is talking about Don Ellis. And I've always felt that Don Ellis had a huge impact, not only on fusion, but also on progressive rock. Both of those genres are really influenced by him. And I hear that influence all over the place. Um, and obviously you're in there right right after Electric Bath, right. which I think is the seminal album. Right. Um, in the background, I have got the George Russell album, Aesthetics which I think is 1962, which features Don Ellis right in the center of that sort of avant-garde experimental jazz. And I think he was so important in bringing those influences through into rock music, really. So, um, and and also uh, the drummer before you, Steve Bohannon, I, I would love for you to tell us about him because yes, he's will. almost disappeared off people's radar, I think. So, um can you tell us all about that time and you getting sure. into that? And Sure. Well, I, I was introduced to Don Ellis uh, at the time that first record came out in 1965, live at Monterey, with Steve Bohannon on it. I was in uh, going to college, San Jose State in California, and uh, our, uh, our jazz band leader brought the album in one day to play for us. And uh, we were all astounded, of course. And, uh, and, uh, this is when I was got introduced to Steve Bohannon, uh, who was also a fine B3 player. So he was not only a drummer, but a great keyboard player. Um, and uh, he had played with uh, Don some time before with the jazz, the Hindustani jazz sextet. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I got familiar with them after I heard this record. Uh, so uh, we were enamored totally with, with, uh, with Don and and uh, our band leader said, well, guess what? I'm inviting Don up to play with our band uh, in a few months. Uh, <clears throat> well, wow, how fortuitous is that? And and I'm bringing and he's bringing Steve Bohannon with him. So I got I got a chance to meet Steve right away. <clears throat> and uh, but the thing is, the re the rehearsal comes and uh, Don flies in and we're ready for the rehearsal, but there's no Steve Bohannon. Uh, he missed the plane. Uh, so guess who got to play the rehearsal? And uh, and so that that's the beginning of the whole story here with me and Don Ellis, is that he got a chance to hear my potential, because that's all it was at the time. Uh, but I was I was a good reader. I had, had always been a good reader, <clears throat> and I and I clawed through the material, 
did the best I could. And then Steve showed up for the concert and I played second drums. Uh, and I got a chance to see Steve firsthand do his thing and, and just remarkable drummer. Just, he really had great instincts. Uh, didn't seem to be bothered at all with time signatures. Uh, had a great feel. Um, the unfortunate thing, of course, is that Steve was killed in a car crash at age 21. Uh, and so he never really had a career after that. And uh, it's, it's a shame. Um, but nevertheless, um, Steve was going to join the services at the NORAD band in, uh, in Denver to serve out his, uh, his duties. Uh, so he was leading the band anyhow. And, uh, and, and this was me in 1968. Uh, well, actually 1967, uh, when I, I got a call out of nowhere from Don Ellis. Uh, I'm living, of course, in Northern California in the Bay Area. And he says, look, you know, Steve is getting ready to leave the band. Um, and I'm looking for a drummer. Would you like to come down and audition? And I thought, wow, that's, that's really amazing that after a few months, he's, he still remembered, you know, what I did with him. And uh, I thought, well, what do I have to lose? This, this is a great opportunity. And uh, I really didn't know what I was about to do, stay in the Bay Area. I was getting a teaching credential. I was probably going to do some teaching, play, the, play in the Bay Area with all the cats there. But I thought, well, hey, th this might be my my foot in the door to go to Los Angeles. So uh, I did go. I did do the audition, and uh, and it was uh, New Year's night, 1968, in a packed club. It wasn't a rehearsal. I auditioned in front of an audience. <laughs> in the Don Ellis band, my God. with those charts. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine more more of a hot seat than that. Uh, and, you must, and you must was, have been a good reader. <laughs> well, and the other thing was this. He didn't really prepare me with, with what I was going to play. He just called me up in the middle of the first set and, and called up, I believe he called up New Nine, uh, which was one of the harder ones for me, actually. I remember listening to it and trying to figure it out. Uh, and then there were a few more tunes after that, and then the set was over. And then Steve came back up and played the rest of the night. And, and People were ecstatic about the band. It was a very popular band at the time, you know. Um, and so uh, Don invited me to his office after the gig and said, well, what do you think? And I was thinking, well, I, I, I did okay, but I, I don't, maybe I'm not ready. And he said, well, you know what, I, I think you are. I think I, I'd like to, uh, to hire you for the band. So that was, that was the beginning of that. And, and it changed my entire career direction. And you know, I not enough is said about Don Ellis. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell us your thoughts on him as a musician, as a composer, as a, as an instrumentalist. Well, all of those things, I think uh, he, he excelled in, he, he definitely had a great compositional skill. Uh, he was involved in a lot of different kinds of music. He was studying with Hari Harau uh, in Pasadena, California, a great tablist and sitarist. Uh, along with a lot of other musicians at the time, Tom Scott, Roger Kellaway, Joe Piccaro, uh, Emil Richards, myself, uh, you know, we are, me eventually. And, uh, you know, he was learning about all the Indian techniques and whatnot. I don't know where he got this bug to do this. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, s soon after that, you know, he formed the band. And, uh, and then soon after that, he decided to go electronic. He had a four valve trumpet, which allowed quarter tones. Uh, and, and, you know, we wore, we wore crazy uniforms, <laughs> Nehru jackets and, uh, and others, you know, so the band had definitely a look. Uh, and, and the one word I could probably use always was it was really exciting. Uh, even though it's at times it was kind of loose because I always felt the band needed more rehearsal because the, the music was hard. And, and there were only a few of us that really took to heart what Don was trying to do. Everybody else was just reading the notes and not necessarily having a feel for what he was doing. Uh, so I think I, I credit the rhythm section for most of his bands for, for understanding what he was trying to do and, and really, really getting a grip on uh, controlling the band. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a, a thoroughly exciting time. And, and you know, Don... Don's trumpet playing, I, I, I think probably people have mixed feelings about his trumpet playing. 
uh, as, a, as a soloist. Uh, you know, I, it's unique. I, I felt he had a unique style uh, and it comes from many different things. There may be Dixieland, uh, free jazz, uh, you know, uh, jazz, of course. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I, I thought he was an innovator in so many different ways. And certainly his compositions were challenging exciting, uh, uh, effective, uh, and uh, he, he, he just had a great, a great sense of, of, of presenting something that was very, very exciting. And what was the culture uh, of the musicianship, particularly in the rhythmic department, in the rhythm section, but also outside of the rhythm section? How did you guys deal well, you know, you know, I got thrown into the band at, uh, in 68. And so the musicians who were in the band at the time uh, were just about ready to leave because Don was getting ready to go on the road. And a lot of them decided, I'm done. Okay. Uh, that would include... Well, was me. there a burnout factor in this band? You know, I, I think everybody felt, okay, I've, I've done this enough. It's time for me to leave, right? Um, huh. And, and it, it could also be that some of them felt that Don tended to be a little too gimmicky. Um, and so they, they, they probably felt, well, you know what, I, I want to be a little more serious or I want to work my way into the studios or something to that effect. Uh, so there were a lot of great musicians who left at that time and then others came in. Uh, uh, a young piano player by the name of Peter Robinson came in. Mm -hmm. Really a fine player, just seemed to have a knack for it. Uh, I saw him with Brand X, actually. Oh, well, you saw a different Peter Robinson. You saw J. Peter Robinson. This, oh. was, uh, this was another Peter Robinson. There you uh, go. Uh, like a kid, you know, he was very, very young, maybe 18 years old. Uh, the bass player at the time, uh, we had a couple different bass players. Some of them didn't work out so well. Uh, Chino Valdez was the original congist in the band. He was phenomenal. He seemed to have a knack, Cuban guy, uh, for Don's music. And he was very, very strong. He got replaced by Lee Pastora. Uh, and uh, the bass player that I ultimately liked playing with in the band was, his name was Dave McDaniel. He was really solid. Uh, a couple uh, other piano players came in and, and left. And, and we finally ended up with Milcho Levia. And, and that's a story unto itself, you know, how he suddenly found his way to the United States, first of all, kind of kind of escaping from Bulgaria at the time because of the political scene that was there. And and Don actually was the one that got him over. Uh, yeah. And uh, I just remember us rehearsing and Milcho walks into the room and sits down and starts to play. And, and we were all dumbfounded with what he could do. You know, uh, talk about a Bulgarian who knew M Bulgarian music and was a fine classical pianist as well. Uh, quite an addition to the band, I got to say. Do you think this accusation of gimmickry, which I've read a few times with um, Don Ellis, um, do you think it was actually the a reaction in him against the avant-garde? Because he seems to, he, he went through that free jazz experiment, highly experimental. Yes. And I, I feel that he picked up the key, some key features from Indian music, from avant-garde with the electronic music, uh, modal improvisation, microtones, and odd time signatures, right. and I think it, it's a work. It's 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 a brilliant uh, with electric bath. A, a brilliant idea to then fuse that with rock music. Um, and I think, don't you feel like that's the problem with jazz? Is the way anybody who tries to make it make it accessible. <laughs> And not, in other words, that means reaching younger people, still making right. heavy music, but reaching young, younger people, gets right. accused of gimmickry, which, of course, Miles did with Bitches Brew at the same, around the same period of time. Absolutely. I mean, we, we would play high schools and colleges, so our audience was mostly young, you know, and, uh, and they were enthralled. They just, they liked the excitement of everything, and, uh, and, and the band really put on a great show. Don would always put on a great show. He, he, Don, Don had a heart condition. Uh, I don't know how long he had it, but I, I, I always feel like he was almost over energetic. Uh, he, he would get very, very animated conducting the band. 
Uh, he would get almost act like a kid, just get really, really excited. Um, and so maybe it was just part of his, his nature, but, but I think po possibly it contributed to the fact that his heart was working really, really hard all those years and mm. it finally, it finally uh, gave out on him, you know? Uh, but, uh, but he, he was able to uh, energize the band and the audience every time he played. So here's a question I'd like to ask you, Ralph. Um, did you play on the soundtrack to the French Connection film? I did. Because I've searched to try and find a credit list for that. Uh, oh, Don, oh, Don oh. made an album later, didn't he, called Connection? And I know, but you did definitely play on the soundtrack for that. Right, right. Oh, that's incredible. That's, that's... Well, both French connections, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the second French connection is, is different. It's it's more orchestral in nature. Uh, but yeah, I was I was involved in both of those. Yeah. Um, if you think of, of, with say, with William Friedkin films, like The Exorcist propelled uh, Mike Oldfield to superstardom with Tubular Bells, why did that not happen for Don? I mean, he... he done the sound, incredible soundtrack and almost like that groundbreaking yeah. soundtrack. But he is a guy to me who is just pioneering so much stuff in that period. Right. Why do you, well, don't you think it, it, that has made I him a household know. name? It, it could have been that Don, maybe he could have gone that in that direction, which means maybe he would have had to stop playing the band and just do composing. You know, so it could have been his decision not to do that. Uh, but he did do films after that. There were a few films that we did after that, um, you know, my, minor films. But, uh, uh, you know, he, he really loved playing. In fact, you know, he, he started playing drums as well and, and put himself in the band as a drummer as well, as a third drum set player. And, uh, again, he played like a kid, you know, just an excited little kid. He just, he just needed to play. And so he had this energy inside him that uh, I suppose – made him who he is you know ralph you mentioned something earlier which i had to connect for for our listeners and and for drummers in general and that is yes the don ellis band did play in high schools and one of the high schools they played in was a pittsburgh high school where there was a student named vinnie Kaliuta in the audience <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> Ah, great. And this, I, I covered this in, in my oral history that I did for, for Yale for Vinny, but he said that this changed his life. Wow. That the Don Ellis band came to his high school and did a um, assembly program, you know, for the right, school. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine that coming at you as a high school music student? And Don, and, and Don would actually because he wanted people to know what we were doing. We would do little little clinics in the afternoon for high schools and colleges, for those who were interested, uh, and, and talk about and demonstrate what we were doing. And uh, I thought that was really cool, you know? Absolutely, I, I think that's a huge part of it. You can't complain that people have no idea what you're doing if you can't present to them in some feasible way right. uh ground floor entry to to the exactly. lobby of what you're doing you know exactly yeah the well, I, I, I must say ralph it's 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 i'm i'm so pleased you mentioned roger kellaway earlier because if you're very eagle-eyed and i put it there not knowing whether it would have any connection to this but behind me is a, is a roger kellaway album called spirit feel it was recorded uh -huh. in 1967 and uh again that was one of my dad's recordings uh, albums and when I started drumming I pulled that out and it was an education because on the back of that album Roger Kellaway has explained the time signatures divisions it's like going to college and later on then when I heard Frank Zappa and and the Mavish Nocturne and then eventually Don Ellis I had a key because of that Roger Kellaway album so the educational parts it that it's it, it came out of that album and right. it's the same thing with Electric Bathy they they that there was a lot of promotion and marketing around about the time signatures with the explanations in that, you know, Don would actually have the divisions as titles, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. So uh, I, I I think, uh, you know, the, the service to music and to musicians and drummers was, was 
a, you know, an incredible uh, thing. Uh, and I my... think, you know, just the, the naturalization, the, the uh, demystification of rhythm, which is essentially arithmetic. I mean, let's face it. It's not yeah, yeah. rocket science, right. as many people think, like, oh, we're in 19 now. Yeah, but... There's groups of threes and twos and twos and threes and and yeah. you'll you'll find the clave and and once we get you in on that level, try to you know you see Indian guys doing this all the time, just trying to keep track of where everything That's is. Right. That's right. And once you're listening in on that level, I think the the enjoyment does increase. Yeah, you know, I I I tend to I talk a lot to my students about you know the metric system and the. Uh, the uh, the uh, linear system, you know, uh, which is about grouping, and I said, yeah, you know, nineteen sixteen, you know, where where is the beat? Well, you know, you you may not be able to find it because it's not there, because it's all about subdivisions, and so you need to find out where the main subdivision points are in the cycle, and then hang on to that, you know. That's really funny that you mentioned nineteen sixteen because. <laughs> This year, I'm I'm doing uh, the 50th anniversary of Birds of Fire shows with Ma Vishnu Project. Oh wow! And and we have uh, been playing celestial terrestrial commuters a lot. Yeah. And finding all of the different ways to divide up 19 in a more musical way than perhaps I've been trying to hang on for dear life in the past. Right. You know, now I'm sort of really dug into what's the clave and. You know, yeah. if I anticipate some things and they'll know where I am and just leaving things out and just different ways of of strategizing 19 so that it doesn't become, in the words of Jan Hammer, like a skipping record. Uh -huh. And that's another <clears throat> thing, too, is, is talking to Jan about this stuff, because I always ask questions of sure. the masters, like, what what were you guys thinking about? Mm -hmm. And you know, the, Jan was a drummer and a keyboard player. Yeah. Can, I, so you, can I just jump in about celestial terrestrial commuters? Yeah. I'm friends with a British drummer called Mark Mondesir, who's possibly one of the greatest time signature drummers on the planet. And we were chatting about that 1916. And he goes, of course, Andy, they did do one bar of 9-8. <laughs> and he stung it to me. And I went, they did. They did. Mark, you spotted it. So yeah. I, I am. I'm through, Mark through me is telling you, Greg, if you're going to do it, you've got to do that bar of nine eight. I'm going to make sure Mark watches and checks you for it. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Mark and Andy. I am such a stickler about that stuff. Whereas in later versions of Mahavishnu, John simplified some of the pieces for blowing. You know, sanctuary yeah. where there are extra beats added, where there are beats taken away from things. He simplified that. Well, we don't simplify anything. So you're right. There is a really, there's a clip off of one of the 19 to get a bar of 18. And, <laughs> and you better be right. Yeah. Well, because the, otherwise you get, it, you know, it's so easy to fall off and, oh, and, yeah. you know, you got to know that that's going to happen. And then everybody looks at each other and we just laugh about it. Yeah. But, but it's got to happen. The, the thing that's not being said with so many people experimenting with Indian music in the 1960s, well, say something, Joe Harrett in the UK, um, Coltrane, perhaps, sure. Don Ellis. But the thing that Don Ellis is bringing in is not just the modality and the, and the microtones. He's bringing in that system. And I think I'm so happy to have Ralph here, you know, and say on this video that I think this is so important because this is such a feature of jazz fusion. You know, here we are talking about the Mavish Nuxtra as though they get the credit for 19 but actually the work's already been done and, and actually been done 67 68 yeah, before yeah. anyone's even got their head round fusion it's right. the, you know it's an incredible yeah incredible thing um have you got any because you played with frank zappa ralph have you got any um sort of observations of how what don did transferred through to what frank was doing <clears throat> That's a good question, and I really don't know if Frank was aware of Don. Um, I, I always felt that Frank, everything Frank did came out of Frank. Um, yeah, he was he was certainly influenced by, you know, the, uh, the French composers of the late 19th century uh, for his more classical stuff. Verres, it should be said. 
the blues guitar stuff that he was influenced heavily by. I, I don't know that he ever had a chance to listen to or be aware of Don Ellis. I just I just don't know the answer to that question. Mm. Uh, Zappa, though, was a big Stravinsky guy, too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he listened to all those guys. Absolutely. Perez, Stravinsky, Bartok. Perez, exactly. I, th I think he had, had a, a correspondence with uh, with Perez, and Perez sent him a score of ionization. And, you know, I'm sure Frank sculled over that and uh, and it developed his style, you know, part, part, part of his style. It's so interesting. Frank is such an interesting figure. I'd love to know anything about how you guys rehearsed that music and, you know, you and Chester together or anything you want to tell us about uh, how you put it together. Where, where Don's band didn't do enough rehearsal, Frank's band did a lot of rehearsal. <laughs> how, how'd you get the gig before, before we go there? How did you get the gig? How did you, you know, because obviously you were with Don for a number of years, right. you know, you then you do the, the do the soaring album, which is my favorite Don Ellis album. Uh -huh. Incredible. You, you, and I was saying to Greg, you know, you, you're the drummer on Whiplash. You're the original Whiplash drummer. I am. <laughs> which I, which I think people don't realize. Uh, of course they don't. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah. we may have to discuss that as well, but we could leave that to <laughs> So, so, you know, how, how did you go from Don to Frank? You well, know, I, I was with Don on and off for five years. Uh, and then I, I decided, okay, it's my time to leave. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, except I wanted to sort of stay in town, uh, maybe start developing a studio career, uh, play with some other people, uh, which which started to happen. And then uh, in 1973, George Duke, who's a good friend of mine from the Bay Area and was in Frank's band at the time, calls me up and says, Frank's looking for a drummer. And he's heard many, many drummers. <laughs> and maybe you should come down and play. And frankly, I didn't have that much familiarity with Frank's music. Yeah, uh, Hot Rats and a few other things. And uh, um, I thought, here's some music I need to actually get into more. But, but uh, I wasn't quite ready yet. But uh, so I, I went down and I auditioned uh, at his rehearsal studio, full band. Uh, this was before Chester. So yep. I was the only drummer. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and the band was George, Jean-Luc Ponty, Bruce <clears throat> and Walt Fowler, uh, Bruce and Tom Fowler, Ruth Underwood, Ian Underwood, Frank, and Sal Marquez, trumpet player. Um, what a great band. That's so a band. We rehearsed and, you know, Frank, he put something in front of me um, that was pretty, pretty dark looking, you know, a lot of black. <laughs> uh, and I, and I somehow manage my way through you know half half-heartedly but uh you know my feeling was he saw i could read and and certainly i had the potential to learn that and then we would do some uh some jamming and some odd meters i'm sure there was a seven or something else and and probably 45 minutes later he stopped and basically said the band take a break called me down and said you want to join the band and that was it so uh and i i gotta say that after don ellis i i felt if I wanted this job, I could have it because Don gave me that that uh, confidence and that knowledge that probably no other drummer at the time had to be able to do what I was able to do. Andy, you really hit it on that. I mean, it's like the prep school for Zappa is Don Ellis. It is. No, I mean, that we, we're looking at, Greg, we're looking at the influence of Don Ellis in the Zappa band because for yeah. me... I, I love Zappa, Zappa, but Zappa's got a spiky, modernist, um, avant-garde rock sound until you come in. And I, I went to see my friend, and his wife's a big Zappa fan. I said, I'm interviewing Val Ralph Humphrey. And she, she went, oh, my favorite albums. Apostrophe, oh. Overnight Sensation, Rocks in Elsewhere. And they're everybody's favorite Zappa albums. There's a change. There's a change, I think. It's it's interesting. You know, I mean, fortunate for me, I was I was at that time, and and you know, people were really starting to listen to Frank, and he was he was creating more songs and and maybe things that might get on the radio, but most of them didn't <laughs> anyhow. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I really I really enjoyed that period uh, that that uh, he was in, and a lot of people call it the golden age, you know, of Zappa, you know. Well, but, it's first uh, first time we hear Inca Rhodes. Yeah, and that that went through many many different <laughs> arrangements. Yeah. Uh, 
the one that ends up on uh, one size fits all uh, is the one that I learned before I left the band. So all the material on one size, I, I knew all that material, but uh, I, I, I left the band at that time. But uh, this is the 50th year of Overnight Sensation. And, and I talked to uh, Joe Travers the other day, the Vaultmeister, of course, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Universal uh, bought, you know, Frank's catalog and, and they were smart enough to bring Joe along. Uh, so Joe now is, is a part of that. But he said, you know, we're going to be releasing uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, concerts that were done in Australia in 1973 in honor of the 50th anniversary of Overnight Sensation. So that should be interesting because now it's Sal Marquez on trumpet and we don't have much documentation of Sal in that band. <clears throat> well, which studio albums is Sal on? A few, right? Grand Wazoo. Is he on Waka yeah. Waka? And and, yeah, exactly. and if if there is a Don Ellis influence on those albums, I I just don't get it. <laughs> you know, there's, <laughs> there, there's you know there's there's two guys making you know expansive rock and jazz fusion with a big band with lots of odd time signatures. One's Don Ellis, one's Frank Zappa, and Frank's doing it after Don. So uh, and Sal, you know, is the featured guy, uh, and I think it you know the 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 inclusion of Sal almost also shows that Frank was listening to Miles as well, I think. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, Miles, I mean, Miles, uh, Frank would kiddingly say, you know, uh, jazz isn't dead. It just smells funny. But he surrounded himself with jazz players because why? They were the only ones that could play his music. And they were cooler to hang out with probably too. <laughs> they were more oh, fun yeah. to be around for Frank. Yeah. yeah. And of course, George was a huge influence, uh, and, and, you know, Frank was big influence on George as well. It got George to sing in the band. Um, and uh, George did just a, such a fantastic job with that. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and, you know, my experience in the band before Chester uh, was I, I really, really, I was having a ball playing that music, learning that music, playing it as well as I possibly could. Uh, for me, Frank was, I was in his band. I was a side man. And whatever he wanted me to do, I'll do it, you know. Um, and I became really, really close with Ruth Underwood. We had a, a wonderful relationship. Just what a fine instrumentalist she is. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, then Ian left the Integral. Band. Integral to Frank's work at that time, Ruth yeah, Underwood. Totally. Absolutely, yeah. And an utter virtuoso. Also, you know, I mean, you when you look at interviews uh, with Ed Mann and he's the respect he's got for Ruth, you can see that she was something she else, was, wasn't she? She was a prodigy at age six on the piano. So she had it from a long time ago. But a huge influence on percussionists, because, you know, when we were hearing bands that had tuned percussion. And I'm in a percussion ensemble in high school or I'm in concert band right, and I yeah. hear I hear my music of my moment. Yeah. Gentle Giant, including, you know, marimba, including vibraphone. Th yeah. These kinds of things I, I just wanted to say, you know, were were huge for me because it meant that the percussion world wasn't just in the orchestra. It right. was now in bands and you had right. guys like Jamie Muir playing sheet metal and all sorts of found objects and King Crimson. So it was a that's a glory and that's also like 72. So it's that period is is remarkable. Uh Guillerme Franco with Keith Jarrett and, and all the different percussion things that he was doing and right, Armin right, Halborian, right. you know. When yeah. we think about that's a golden age too for percussion, the art ensemble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what but, Don Moom did with uh, Weather Report, you know, and, and you know, the sounds he was getting, you know, just really and Ayerto as well, you know. Ayerto, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's coming through miles. Coming through miles, that's right. Yeah, so many yeah. guys came through miles, you know, and uh, what a what a conduit that was, huh? Just amazing. And Wait, then, so each... so, sorry, so I'm, I'm going to ask your question because I felt rude jumping into it, but earlier you were going to say what was a what what was a a rehearsal like? So if you if you're learning a track, to say like "Don't Eat the Yellow Snow," okay, is that coming in as one piece? Has he got it all charted, or are you oh, working? No. You know, yeah, seeing Alfonso's. All yeah. that. So he, he would be events finally put together. So we would record, we rehearse an event at a time. <clears throat> and, you know, people would be writing notes down that Frank would be dictating. 
I, I had a tape recorder rolling for the rehearsal. So I'd go home at night and listen to that tape and remember everything that we did, because I, I wasn't writing anything down. I was <laughs> learning it this way. <clears throat> I wanted to learn it this way. Wow. I didn't, I didn't need to write it, uh, because I'm, I'm a very melodic guy, too. I played clarinet for a number of years. And so to me, melody, I related to the melody, and that would tell me what the rhythm was. If sure. I could sing the melody and relate to the melody, I knew what the rhythm was. <clears throat> but other people were having to write things out. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we would come to the rehearsal the next day and go over, you know, what we had rehearsed the, the, the previous day. And Frank would expect everybody to have their parts together. <clears throat> and uh, and in fact, they did, you know. And so then he would say, "Okay, let's 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 do the next event. I'm putting this thing together." And eventually, after five days, you know, we'd have something like Saint Alfonso's or Inca Rose or whatever we were working on as a piece of music. And, uh, and then we'd rehearse the heck out of it. And then Frank would change it. You know, he was constantly messing with it, you know, well, let's do this here instead. And let us do this here instead. And then I have these hand signals, <clears throat> which could change everything on a dime. <clears throat> and we would insert a, a little element in the middle of something. Yeah, and so we had we had to learn quite a few things that uh, we and it meant that we had to keep our eye on Frank at all times because you never knew what he was about to do. Can you so tell the us a little? Were intense, uh, but by the end of, of the rehearsal time, we knew the music; it was memorized, and we were ready to go. Did you keep your cheat sheets? No, no. I don't know that I had many, actually. Like I said, I, I decided to learn the music just by listening to it, and uh, and uh, you know, re obviously recording it so I could play it back and listen to it and and uh, recall what it was. And uh, so to this day, I mean, I you know, I I, re I, re I retain music pretty well. I don't retain much of anything else, but I really do retain music. Good and, auditory memory. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. So, well, this is this this is really interesting because I I I interviewed Narada Michael Walden um, last year, and I asked him the same question. I said, "When you joined the Mavishnuksha, did you have charts?" And he went, "There ain't no charts at that level." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, and it's right. it's and I think you know yeah, you may work on your reading, make sure you can nail this. But the these this was the, the forefront of what was going on, wasn't it? So I suppose. Frank maybe not didn't quite know where he was going with it and needed musicians that could that are more malleable perhaps and could uh well, yeah. then... you know Ralph you're so involved with education so I know that you see different types of learning of music and and it's interesting right so yeah. I just find it now so few kids want to learn to read because they're able to make music so naturally so organically even you know including the computer but just that musicality comes through and to place the value of, of, of sight reading on top of that yeah. seems in some ways less and less relevant. Am, am I wrong there? Uh, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people do have that attitude that uh, reading is not as important as it used to be because of how, how we learn now, you know, uh, <clears throat> But, you know, part of it is just, you know, being lazy and not learning how to read, you know, because it could serve you well at some point. You know, I mean, if you're if you're looking at uh, doing a, a a musical, you know, being being in a pit band, you better know how to read. You know, um, if you're if you're playing in a, in a concert band or a concert orchestra, you need to know how to read, you know, and then if you're going to play with Frank Zappa, you better know how to read, you know. <clears throat> What was the most challenging Zappa piece for you? Oh gosh, <laughs> I guess it would depend. Uh, some of the faster stuff, for sure. Uh, that seven thing in Inca Roads. Uh, and and yes, that and also uh, Redunzel, the real fast three four. Mm. I mean, it was burning, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, in terms of the some of the reading stuff. Uh, the most difficult thing I think maybe we had to learn was something called the, the bebop tango, you know, yeah. uh, which is a kind of a precursor to the black page, you know, in terms of its blackness. Uh, <laughs> but, 
but it wasn't a drum solo. It was a, it was an ensemble piece. But uh, you know, uh, Frank Frank would uh, take the liberty to to change tempos on us a lot of times and play things almost faster than we could actually play. Uh, so he was constantly challenging the band on the bandstand uh, to do what he wanted us to do. Uh, you know, for me, okay, go go for it. You know, I, I hope that we hang in there. And you know, almost always we did. But I love this ethic of spontaneity in Frank's work. There's this exactitude and then there's this complete wildness. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He, he knew how to put on a show. You know, he really, really did. What was uh, John Luke Ponty's input in that band? What was his input? Yeah. Uh, he, he, not much. I, I think uh, he was just one of the instrumentalists that... Uh, just played so well and, and added a, a great thing to, to Frank's music. But Frank would dictate to John Luke what he wanted him to do. And uh, John Luke would just do it, you know? So, you know, I don't see that. I don't, I don't think it went the other way. Mm. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Jean Luke because um, I know in conversations that I've had with Jean Luke, he cites Frank as an inspiration for composition. Right. You know, because I don't think Jean Luc gets enough credit for his composing. He's quite a composer. I, I agree with you. And yeah. for that reason of yes, he will have things return and modulate. He will have variation. He will have transitional sections. There's going to be material more so than there would have been in Mahavishnu very often. So you uh, see right. the Zappa influence, not not the Mahavishnu influence in Ponty. And right. he talks about how Frank could take an idea, one idea and change it and develop it yeah and how you don't need seven ideas you could have two ideas three ideas exactly, exactly. No, yeah the, right. and the interesting thing with frank is is he he presented two musicians in his time didn't he john john luc ponty with king kong and el shanker um we touched me there both violin players and both right. who went on to play with john mcgoughlin <laughs> Very strange. I, <laughs> strange. I witnessed. I was one of the audience members for seventy eight Halloween, where Shankar sat in every night with Vinny on drums. Wow! In thirteen, wow. and and all of the stuff. I mean, we were weeping. We had never heard drumming like that. We had heard. Right. I knew Shakti, so we knew who Shankar was. Right. But he came out, and it's one of those modal odd meter things, and the drummer is going to kick the soloist, and Shankar and Vinny, I'll never forget it. Wow. it. It's on one of the you can't do stage. I mean, uh, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. There you, you know. go. And there's the Don Ellis thing of, of Zappa letting the audience in on the internal workings of that tune on that track. Right, right. Incredible. What What was your motivation to then? Um, oh, could you tell us a little bit about Chester coming in? What was the decision for him to bring two drummers in? Again, Don and Don had used two drummers. So I, I will point these out as we go. But why did well, why did Frank bring in another drummer? Well, you know, we we did ten concerts with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and I was hoping you were going to tell this story. Please, we, we, we followed the Mahavishnu Orchestra. I had to follow Billy Cobham. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, can you just can you just say can you can you just explain the effect of Cobham on the drumming world at that point? Um, you know, well, because I you're right in that. there and just explain I, what it was I, like I, to see. I knew, what, I knew what effect he had on me, uh, which was huge. You know, when I when I first heard the Mahavishnu Orchestra, uh, which was Intermounting Flame, I was on a bus with Don Ellis going to a gig. So somebody brought it in and and it, it, it was played, and again our, our jaws dropped what what the heck is this now you know so uh you know billy was you know a huge influence on me so i would i would be backstage every concert watching them play and watching billy and realizing oh my god i i'm five foot six 135 pounds and billy's a freaking marine <laughs> just, just, you know, just so powerful and so he he taught me something about power and I had to figure out how can I, how can I become stronger, because I I always felt I could probably be stronger in Frank's band, and so I, I recall at that very time practicing on a pillow 
in the, in the, uh, in the hotel room every day, trying to work on my rebounds and everything and just, just really working hard. And I, I even started using Billy's stick, which was a bigger stick than I was using just to, so I could get more sound. And I, it actually worked. I, I got better. I got faster and I got more powerful. Uh, so Billy influenced me directly by watching him, but, but the band would blow me away every night. And then, you know, my thinking was, how am I going to come out on stage now and, and play? And, and I, it occurred to me immediately, I have to play Frank's music. I have to be, I have to be in Frank's band. I got to forget about what I just saw with Mahavishnu. I, I can't compete. I'm not going to compete. And so I, that was a good lesson for me. Play what you know in this band be appreciated for what this band is doing different than what that band is doing. And so uh, that was, that was a good lesson for me. And, and of course I got to chat with Billy and backstage and whatnot. And uh, you know, you know, you, you talk a lot, Andy, about Billy and, and being a part of the, uh, the whole fusion thing and, and maybe being in the top three or four drummers that, that uh, you know, gave us, gave us that style. Uh, but going back to Chester, so after playing those 10 concerts with the Mahavishnu, um, and Ruth Underwood sort of cites this later on when we had a discussion, uh, a round table with Chad and, and, and Chester and myself and, and Ruth and, and, and Terry. Yeah, Ruth thought maybe Frank realized the power that was coming off the band with the Mahavishnu. And in order to get that in his band, he needed to add another drummer. So, so that's one theory. Maybe it's, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. Um, I don't really know. Um, I think Chester, I Ch Chester has, has spoken about that being the case. Okay. But yeah. after that, I arrived at, at a new set of rehearsals because we were getting ready to go on the road again. And lo and behold, there's two drum sets on the stage. Unbeknownst to me, Frank had hired Chester Thompson. And so I walked in. Now with, oh, well, what's going on, you know? And Frank didn't say a word. Uh, and I met Chester, and uh, suddenly he was in the band. And and so it's like, well, how is this going to work out, you know? And and I, I was feeling weird. Uh, I was not. I didn't know what this meant, you know. Uh, what was my role going to be? Was it going to change? Uh, was Frank not happy with what I was doing? I, a thousand things went through my head. Uh, so we started rehearsing, and by the end of the rehearsal, I I, I had to decide: am I am I am I going to stay in, or am I going to get out? And I decided to stay in because, well, this worked out in Don's band with more than one drummer, and certainly can work out here. And I and I can accept this. You know, Chester is certainly a great drummer, and uh, but what we're going to have to do is learn how to play with one another. Because Chester comes from Baltimore, he's an R&B drummer, jazz drummer. I come from the West Coast, as, as white as you can be. Uh, and and how are we going to come together here? You know. Hello, everybody. Here I am with the legendary drummer Ralph Humphrey from the Don Ellis Band and from the Frank Zappa Band. Um, we've been chatting all afternoon, and uh, we've had computer problems, and we may have lost. It may be the great lost interview, mightn't it, Ralph? <laughs> that we've had discussing all these different things musically and uh we've just back just uh jumped back online we've lost greg bendian who was in the conversation but uh me and greg just started chatting and and we were i was just about to ask greg what was the music you grew up listening to and i thought well let's just hit record and see what we get Rob. so uh you know what what was in your house growing up well my mother was a pianist and uh she played light classics, although she played, you know, some Chopin and Debussy, and um, she was pretty good. And uh, she she listened to a lot of uh, ragtime, Dixieland. Um, so I was listening to a lot of that and kind of getting into the whole idea of swing. And, uh, you know, but I was a clarinetist. I started clarinet at age nine and uh, became pretty proficient, actually. And I went through high school and junior college as a clarinetist. So I played about 12 years and my mother would accompany me on these little festivals and I would earn, you know, red and blue rib ribbons and things like that. And, uh, but that's how I learned how to read was by playing the clarinet. And of course, learning how to play in an ensemble, 
uh, playing the clarinet was also valuable to me for later on when I played in the ensembles of Don Ellis and Frank Zappa and others. So, you know, I, I thank my mother for my early education in music. And I, I came to love it. Uh, I, I knew that I sort of had a propensity toward it. And, uh, and that kind of that's kind of how it started. And you and you're involved. I mean, you're known for playing some incredibly complex and innovative, you know, music with Don and Frank. How how do you feel melody relates to dense rhythms? How do, how do you think they relate? Well, they relate perfectly. Uh, uh, you know, melody is so important in music, and most people relate to melody more than anything else. Uh, so if you can sing the melody to something, you're also singing the rhythm of that melody, you know, without even knowing what the rhythm might be, uh, because the melody is telling you what the rhythm is. And so... I, I relate a lot to melody in music, and I think it helped me a lot with uh, playing with Don and playing with Frank. Uh, but before that, when I was you know, in high school, just practicing the drums, I played a lot to the Dave Brubeck Quartet, uh, and the melody there was so important. You know, uh, I, I can sing every note that, uh, that Dave played and, and, and the sax player as well. Uh, 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 but of course, I was in love with Joe Morello, but uh, I, I kind of learned how to play in five in high school before I even know that it was going to turn out to be valuable later on in my career. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I I, I, I think Brubeck was, you know, he was the first pioneer of time signatures, wasn't he? And that was so important. And, and I've always felt there was a relationship between Brubeck and Don Ellis, and I've never been able to quite work out that, what that is. But this what you've said about melody is very interesting and because i'll show off with my students and i'll play i'll play a 10 over four but i don't really know what a 10 over four is i just think of you know the melody off of montana is my 10 over four you know that is that is yeah it's the melody that does it it's it's the it's the it's the shape you know of of the melody the contour i feel is 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 where rhythm is. It's a it's a really interesting thing. So that's that's very interesting. You started on clarinet. How how did you start on drums? How did how did drumming uh, coming about? That, that's interesting too. Uh, in high school, um, I guess I was always sort of interested in drums, although I didn't know that I would eventually play the drums. But I didn't know what I was going to do anyhow. I mean, I was playing clarinet at the time, and uh, uh, but. Um, I was, uh, my mom bought this record called Pete Fountain Day. Pete Fountain's a great clarinetist, jazz, sort of jazz clarinetist. Um, and I was trying to play along with him, you know, learning about his licks and whatnot, because I was definitely interested in, in jazz and all that sort mm. of thing. But he had a drummer in his band, and his name was Jack Sperling. And Jack Sperling was a great session musician in Los Angeles. Um, but he happened to also play with Pete. And, and so as I was lis listening to Pete, I was also beginning to listen to Jack and what he was doing, and it really turned me on. And so at that point, I think I asked my mom for a pair of sticks, uh, just so I could maybe tap along, you know, uh, with what was going on. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm, uh, I'm playing clarinet in this Dixieland band, this high school Dixieland band. And we had this one, you know, uh, gig at a, at a shopping mall in my hometown. And uh, the drums were there, but the drummer did not show. Uh, and so somebody had to sit down and play the drums. And so I sat down and I, I knew the music and I kind of knew what to do on the drums. And that was the beginning of it. After, after that day, it was like, oh, I really like this. <laughs> I really like this, you know. Uh, so that, that I played clarinet continuously still, but but I became a drummer and, and started getting into the jazz band in high school and joined another Dixieland band, you know, out of school as the drummer. And uh, from that point, I went to junior college in San Mateo. Uh, I had some wonderful teachers. Uh, one was the, uh, the jazz band director who had a, uh, had a gig band outside of school. And I was fortunate enough to join that band and actually start gigging as a drummer in San Francisco. And that, and that kind of was 
beginning of my drumming career. And what about things like the technical, you know, the say rudimental playing and hand technique? Did you have lessons um, or? I, I uh, my high school teacher was a drummer, and he would show me some things. But I guess I was essentially self-taught. Um, I learned a lot by listening. Um, my technique was okay, uh, but I, I didn't really get into technique till later. Um, and uh, learning learning about motion and 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 whatnot, uh, which I teach to this very day. So yeah, te technically technique lessons came a little bit later, but not that many lessons. I was really kind of self-taught. Yeah, same here. I mean, I, my, I, I learned off of the records I listened to. I, I really yeah. did. Um, and uh, my dad, it, 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 he, he taught me how to do a jazz swing and he would make me just play jazz swing. Um, and I think if you can yeah. swing, that jazz swing gives you the, the three basic strokes of drumming. <laughs> you know, you get the sort of whip down and then the wrist come up and then the pull out. And, and I, I really feel that that is a, contained in jazz there's so much contained in jazz swing so much it's like yes. esoteric information hidden inside that the feel of it there's, there's a sort of three against two feel so you get sort of polyrhythmical dotted eighth note thing going on and you get the technique and the, yeah. you get weight and dynamics on syncopation it's it's a, it's such an important education to learn how to swing it is yeah uh, listening you know I, I talk to my students all the time about you know, reading and, and listening, you know, they go together, you know, you, you, you need both skills, but you certainly need to have this skill, you know, um, some people can hear things and they have no idea what it is, is until they see it. Other people, um, you know, uh, don't need to see it. They just, they just hear it and can play it. And uh, I don't know, I think that's a, that's a gift that many of us have that we can actually hear something and, and actually play it back or sing it or whatever um, and have a, a sort of a natural understanding of what it is. Uh, maybe we can't write it because, you know, maybe our skill there is not so good, but uh, fortunately for me, because I played clarinet, I really learned how to, how to read. And then playing percussion instruments later on in college uh, also helped me out a lot. And did you feel when you got the gig with the Don Ellis band, it was, it was, was it the reading or obviously you've got a lot of understanding of sort of wind ensembles and orchestration as well, playing the clarinet. So uh, did you feel that was the thing that sort of Don spotted? It was a combination of things, you know, um, <clears throat> again, I, for some reason had a, a skill to, to understand what he was talking to me about regarding rhythm and how the Eastern way of rhythm is definitely different than the Western way of rhythm in terms of how you analyze it, how you play it, how you hear it, uh, and the grouping concept. Uh, that was so enlightening, and, and I totally understood it. What I had to do was learn how to feel it, you know, understand the mechanics. I got, I got that. Then it was to, how do you get loose in this? And, and that was probably the thing that I was trying to uh, to work on as I played in the band was I, I want to feel free in nine or in seven or even in 19, you know, uh, how, how do I open it up? <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, Don really helped me there to, to learn how to do that. And uh, I was able to eventually to, to uh, feel pretty comfortable in just about any time signature. Um what can you uh i mean obviously we've done this interview and it's it's all sort of gone a little bit wrong so anyone's watching this we've been talking for about an hour haven't we or and then the computer's crashed oh yeah and i said yeah. to to ralph you know um, we can't talk about that again but i really would like to get across to my viewers the importance of don ellis and the influence he had on not only jazz rock and prog can you just could you just talk a little about, a bit about that, you know, what you felt he brought to the music scene at that time? Yeah, well, you know, um, because, you know, that was happening in 1965 with his band, and I had had the good fortune of uh, being turned on to that first record by my, uh, my college teacher. Um, I, uh, I was enthralled with what I was hearing, 
I'd never heard anything like it before. I, w I loved who the drummer was, Steve Bohannon. Uh, I felt that he was playing some really interesting stuff. And, uh, and you know, the, uh, the band director told the band, I'm bringing Don in to play with our, our band in a few months. And so we're going to play some of this material. And I thought, oh, oh boy, this is going to be fun. And he said, and we're bringing his drummer as well. So, uh, you know, during that time, I had a chance to really dig into the record and listen to it all. I, uh, I think eventually we got sent charts, uh, which was helpful to, so I could see the relationship of what I was hearing to what the chart looked like. And of course, Don's charts were not written in a typical way. He would write out the subdivision. Yeah, there would be a time signature, but there would also be a subdivision of that time signature. Um, so you could see the, the, the linear fashion of the rhythm, you know, the, the cyclic fashion of the rhythm. And so as I, as I watched the, uh, the written music and listened to the, uh, them playing, I was able to sort of bring the two together and really understand where his music was coming from. Uh, and as advanced as it was, because no one else was doing that. And uh, and I, I listened to the drummer a lot. I loved his energy. I loved his way he set things up. You know, he was he just seemed very comfortable in what he was doing. And so lo and behold, when the band did, when Don did come up to, to play with our band, uh, his drummer, Steve, missed the airplane and was and did not play the rehearsal. I got to play mm. the rehearsal. Mm. So that was that was a huge education right there. And it gave Don a chance to to hear where I was coming from at the time. And certainly, um, at the very least, I had some potential. And uh, and he saw that because later on, he gave me a call uh, a few months later and said, please come down and audition for the band, which is what I did. Yeah, you're, you're, you're such a gentleman, Ralph, because you, I can tell you're a heavyweight studio player because you're doing a second take on this. For all you watching, we, we've been chatting for ages with, with the great Greg Bendian, and I'm sat here, and uh, it's like these computers crashed. Greg's gone, so I thought, well, I'll get a, you know, we'll hit record and we'll have a chat. And you're doing a second take, and it's absolutely perfect. So I, I you know, respect for able to do that. What I'm going to do to Thank mix you. these things up, I've got two albums I want to show you because I know you I know you love my channel and you love seeing all the records and what I talk about. So I'm just going to grab a re record that's very important to me, uh, Ralph. Okay. As a 12-year-old budding drummer listening to ACDC, I went through my dad's collection, I think a week after I started drumming, and I found this album, which is actually a very rare album, and it's very hard to find anything about it. By Roger Kellaway, Spirit Field, Spirit Field featuring a 17-year-old Tom Scott. And on the back, yep. you have got um, basically a description of each tune. And so you get um, 10 to 5, written by Emil Richards, incorporating the use of 10, 4 and 5, 4. The tune is constructed into two alternative sections. The 10, 4 section is subdivided 3, 3, 3, 1. The 5, 4 section is 3, 2. This was so important and uh, I, yeah. I brought it you know talking to you even though you're not on this album I brought it in because I felt you must have connections with these guys Roger Kellaway, Tom Scott, Chuck Domenico, John Guerin, Paul Beaver, Red Mitchell <laughs> well, I mean the great Red Mitchell yep. you know uh, um, that 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 it was such an incredible breakthrough wasn't it? it was what Don brought from Indian music into the way we all now play drums, this what I call additive rhythm. You know, how would you describe it? This rather than dividing everything up into the crotchet, this idea of having clusters of uh, 16th notes or eighth yeah, notes, absolutely. you know. Additive rhythm is the perfect description. Uh, uh, breaking things down, not according to, you know, subdivisions of beats, but subdivisions of the bar according to threes and twos or multiples of threes and twos. So, you know, um, that's what Don Ellis taught me because I, I took some lessons with Don. I took some lessons with Hari Har Rao, along with some of the other people you just mentioned there, mm. because they were also in Don's band, at least in his sextet before the big band. And, uh, and so there was, a, there was a crowd of musicians in LA that were onto this. Onto this. And I think Don was the catalyst. And, uh, and so he's, he's such an important figure with all this. And, uh, you know, Steve Bohannon was a member of that kind of group. And uh, um, along with, uh, well, Garen, John Garen was just a wonderful player. 
uh, in, in so many different ways. I, I watched him a lot when I moved to LA uh, and learned a lot from John. And, uh, and he also had a propensity towards playing odd meters. You know, I don't think he was as skilled as Steve Bohannon was, but he certainly understood how to, how to get through something. Just a, just a wonderful musician. Steve uh, Bohannon is a, is, is a legendary drummer, isn't he? He's really a pioneer of odd time signature playing. And, you know, I think he's, he's not known. He, 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 after Electric Bath and those albums where he'd really pioneered that approach, I, I, I think he died in 68, was it, in a car crash? Yeah, he died at age 21. Yeah, 21. Was tragic. And, uh, really was. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier, but, you, you know, you brought this knowledge into the Zappa band. Um, and I think from what you've been saying, I felt that that when you joined the band with Overnight Sensation, Apostrophe, Roxy and Elsewhere, there was a swing and a groove to those time signatures, which I don't think Zappa had had before you came in. And I don't think you get the credit for that. You know, there was a there was a funkiness to that band, wasn't there? <laughs> yes, there was. I, I agree with you. Yeah. And I, I can thank, you know, what I did with Don, what I learned with Don Ellis, because we played a number of different styles, you know, we rarely played in 4-4, actually, but uh, occasionally we did. And at the same time, I was learning about other grooves and things like that in Los Angeles, playing with other people. So I, I was giving myself an education as, you know, uh, as well as being playing with Don Ellis and recording with him. So um, I was, because I, I always had a, a, in my mind that I wanted to do, do, a, do sessions. I thought I had, I had the ability to be a session musician. I knew how to play with a click. I, I knew all the styles. Uh, I could get a good sound. I had a good feel, uh, and I could read. I think reading was, you know, one of the one of the good things I had in my pocket. Whatever you want to throw in front of me now, after Don Ellis, it's going to be okay. I can handle it, you know. That's that's interesting. Um, I, I, when I was growing growing up, I got a copy of Electric Bath. That was a very important album for me but my favorite don ellis album was soaring uh i i felt the band was so tight on that and so there was just a, a conciseness to that and, and tightness electric bath is quite sprawling and psychedelic isn't it and i think shock treatment that you're i think the first one you're on is just very similar but soaring yes. and and i love that album um it's it's since sort of gone down into drum history because it contains the tune whiplash you are the original Whiplash drummer. So can you tell us a little bit about that <laughs> album and a little bit about that session? Well, I, I, I agree with you that the band does sound tighter on that record. Um, I don't know why. I, you know, we probably rehearsed those tunes and uh, played them on the road before we recorded. So everybody was pretty familiar with the material. Uh, but yeah, that Whiplash is on that on that record. And uh, of course, the uh, the ensuing movie featuring that song. Um, I, I, I had a hard time watching that movie, by the way. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, this this is going to be the great moment of this video, I think, is that, you know, the original Whiplash drummer, here you are, Ralph, and I don't think you've got credit for that, you know, that when they made that film and they wanted a hard drum track, they went for Mr. Ralph Humphrey and his performance on that tune. So, you know, what do you think of the film? <laughs> Well, I, I I can't agree with the, the the film regarding, you know, the 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 leader, um, his his treatment of the band, and especially the drummer. I mean, that's that's just not how you do things. So I I, I was I was troubled with that, um, and uh, you know, Hank Levy, the composer of that that film. And are you still there? Yeah, I'm just having a little bit of problems there. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, you, know, um, you can Hank, you can you can still hear me, can't you? Okay, Hank Levy is the composer of that tune, and, and Hank wrote a lot for Don, and Hank Hank had a great band in uh, in Baltimore at Towson State College, and uh, and Don found uh, in Hank uh, a sort of uh, enjoyment of how he was writing, you know, and and I think it helped Don to Don to bridge the gap between Don's sort of crazy sub uh, compositions and 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 Hank's more in the groove in the pocket kind of thing. So Whiplash was kind of a pocket tune, you know, in seven. And uh, the fact that they ended up using the song in, uh, in, the, in the film Whiplash, I thought was kind of interesting. But, you know, nobody ever contacted me to talk about my performance of the, of the original Whiplash or 
or even asked me to play on, on that on that film. Uh, they they did it completely uh, separate from you know from me and and my knowledge of it. So when it when it came out, I was I was sort of I, I chuckled. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, when I watched it, I, I thought as a, a as a, a piece of entertainment, I was entertained by it. I was drawn into the characters uh, yeah. as a description of how music's made. It just lacks the love. I mean, for me, great music is an expression of love. I I mean, I'm played for forty years. Took me a while to realise it, you know. But you're yeah. you're with the musicians because you love them, and 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 that's how you get performances out of people. I and mean, you ca people can be harsh. I'm sure Frank Zappa was harsh with you but it's a different type of harshness isn't it it's there's it's well, not it was yeah i mean i i could handle frank because i i respected him so much for for his his compositions and what he wanted he wanted perfection um and so he 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 got a band together that gave him near perfection uh pretty much most of the time and uh and i was okay with that you know um and you know, five five days a week rehearsals for three or four weeks before going on the road, that was that was the routine. And uh, and so you know, by the time four weeks was up, we were ready to go, and and that's why the band came off so well because it was so darn tight, playing this really difficult music. But the, and, the, uh, those albums are the most ex accessible albums, and he doesn't compromise. It's, it's it's also got another level of of metric density from what he went before. The the compositions in you know mixed you know uh, um, the middle section of Montana, Saint Alfonso, you know, oh, yeah. um, bebop tango. Uh, these are incredible. But for many people, these are their favorite Zappa albums. That band was a magical band, wasn't it? Well. I, I thought it was. I really enjoyed myself, and I thought the personnel was was top notch. You know, I, I I couldn't imagine playing with better players than George Duke and John Luke and Ian and Ruth and the Fowler brothers. And you know, it was just amazing. He he, he brought something out of George Duke, didn't he? Because George Duke was he a did. heavy heavyweight jazz pianist, and Frank turned George him into discs pop star, songwriter, funky Parliament funkadelic. You know. Virtuoso, yeah. just keep on this. this uh... Absolutely, George brought the funk in the band, and uh, you know, I, 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 I relate a lot to keyboard players um, when I play drums, um, and uh, what George would lay down would always be so damn funky, and and I just loved playing with him. You know, he was very, very much a catalyst in that band. Um, after you left, after you left Frank Zappa, was that too? You know, you, you said you wanted to pursue a, a career as a session player. Was that the reason why? I, I, you know, this is funny. You know, people, you know, leave bands for various reasons. Um, I, I came to a point in 1974. I can't remember the exact moment that that happened, but I just felt it's, I've done my time. You know, I've done this. I, I've really enjoyed it but I, I want to do something else. And so I, I made the decision to leave the band. And, you know, um, I never knew how Frank felt about that, whether he was ready for me to leave the band or it, it didn't seem to bother him because he, he went straight ahead and, and Chester, you know, went from that point on. But I, you know, I, I felt fine about it. Um, I didn't miss playing in the band. I really felt like I, I contributed a lot. I had a lot, a lot of fun, traveled the world, uh, met some wonderful people that I still am, am friends with to this day, and uh, and but I wanted I wanted to do something else. Ralph, be before you split, man, thank you so much. I mean, this is just an honor to talk to you. But I had to ask you about one of my favorite recordings that you're on, and we just recently lost Wayne Shorter. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about the the uh, Atlantis sessions. Well, thank you. I. I uh, that was a special moment for me, I have to say, you know, you know, being in love with uh, Miles and Wayne and the whole 63 through 68 band with Tony and Herbie. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how much I played those records and how much I love that band. Um, and, uh, and then Wayne going to Weather Report and loving that band. Um, so 
Um, Were you ever up for Weather Report? No, I guess that's the one band I wish I could have played with. That would have been Ralph. You did on this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the closest I got. <laughs> yeah, it's a close. Yeah, this. I was just. I. I. Before we started recording, I was. This album was so important to me growing up. This was, you know, this. The, you know, this is one of my dad's albums, and uh, you know, I learned every single track. And for me, the definitive version of Birdland is the one on here with you, uh, you and you Jeff know. Picaro drumming. You know, so. Uh, so, um, Joe Vitarelli, the composer of. Uh, uh, endangered species. I had worked for him before. And um, so Wayne endangered had... species is not a Wayne composition. Apparently not. I know. Uh, now, maybe maybe there was collaboration. But, and maybe and maybe I'm wrong. But I, I, I think Joe got credit for the composing uh, of that tune. But it's such a Wayne tune. It's such a Wayne tune. Of course it is. <laughs> I know. So we need to find the answer to that one. Okay? That's interesting. I didn't know Wayne collaborated compositionally. I thought well, Wayne had everything. Well, maybe, maybe it's strictly Wayne and he had Joe put it down on the synthesizer. Well, because that's also a, an, an interesting turning point in Wayne's career because now what he's doing a lot more MIDI, he's doing a lot more yeah. uh, synthesized arrangements, right? He can, yeah. and the drums were live. But other stuff was programmed, right? That's right. It was all programmed. Yeah. Where everything else you hear, except for me and Wayne and percussion, is synthesizer. <clears throat> so uh, Joe calls Kids me up. Voices. Joe calls me up there in the, there in the studio and he says, I, I need you because you know how to read. <laughs> and Wayne is here and we have this track, this final track for the record that we need to do. Can you come down? I said, well, of course, <laughs> I'm coming down. Are you kidding? Uh, so I did. And, uh, you know, the chart was printed out. It must have been eight, nine pages long. Uh, so I stretched it out in front of the drums. I got the drums there. Um, I listened to it down. I, I looked at it. And Wayne is in the, in the control room, not saying a word. Um, he's letting me just sort of grok it, you know. And, uh, and so I, I kind of, in my head, kind of see thought about it and what I wanted to do. So I, I moved the China boy to my left side because I wanted to do something this way, not that way. And um, kind of kind of decided what's what's the first section going to be? What's the sex, second section going to be? And then there's that incredible syncopated couple of times sections at the end. And I said, I need to keep the groove. I can't just go crazy now with all these figures because it's going to just break it down. So So I had that in my mind. And so, uh, so you started, grew through all of those, but you hit those accents. I hit the accents, but I'm still giving you the backbeat, right? I wanted to bring both of them together because I didn't want the groove to go away. <clears throat> so actually, when I when I went out to record the drums, Wayne also came in and re and was playing along with me. So he has some other takes that he did that I recall that were fantastic, of course. Um, but it, you know, it took me a few times to go through it until I said, "Okay, I think I'm ready," and then and then we started recording, and uh, and uh, and I got it finally. And uh, it, it's it's a challenging piece of music, but uh, <laughs> yeah. when I when I finished and when I listened to it back, I I just felt so great that I was going to be on a record with Wayne Shorter. Your channel is becoming like it's it's just like an encyclopedia of progressive musicians, and I think. You know, in, in the future, it will be seen as a very important resource. Anyway, yeah. less than a minute is saying. That. Thank you. That's the goal, everybody. Thank you. Love the music. See Love you all me. in a bit. See you all in a bit. Bye-bye. <laughs>